Hello and welcome to a special edition of Chamber Chat. Today's guest is Congressman John Tierney. Uh, Congressman Tierney is the U.S. Representative of the 6th District and has served in Congress since 1997. Uh, he has co-authored several important pieces of legislation, including the Green Jobs Act of, nine, of 2007 and the College Affordability and Accountability Act of 2008. Uh, Congressman Tierney sits on the Committee uh, of Oversight and uh, Government Reform and is the former chair of the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs. On that committee, uh, he helped establish a commission on wartime contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan and chaired a hearing on the conditions in uh, the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Welcome, Congressman Tierney. Well, thank you, Joe. Good to be here. Uh, and welcome back to Burlington. Yeah, we'll always love to be in town. Uh, I want to begin with uh, your views on the landscape of American politics, uh, specifically the post-debt uh, ceiling debacle and the president. Um, an adage made uh, famous uh, from uh, Mario Cuomo, uh, you ca campaign uh, with poetry and you govern with uh, prose. <laughs> and we know that uh, President Obama uh, is adept at both, and uh, he has a uh, uh, young uh, speechwriter who is uh, being touted as the new Ted Sorensen. Uh, John uh, Farveau, I think, is his right. name. Uh, but, uh, From the district, as a matter of fact. Yes, yes, yeah. a local fellow. Yeah, ready. Uh, right. uh, but more importantly, uh, other than the uh, uh, sort of the, the literary side of the president and his, uh, his ability to convey a message, uh, both poetic and, uh, and uh, uh, with, uh, with style and grace, uh, the question that I think many are raising is, are from, the, from an old... Uh, political uh, charge, uh, where's, where's the beef? Um, and I, you know, the concern is even some of my uh, very liberal Democratic friends are starting to uh, sort of really question uh, whether or not uh, President Obama is going to be able to accomplish uh, what he wanted to and, and what many people wanted uh, to see accomplished over these years. So as a uh, really a longstanding congressman uh, and involved in many of these, um, What's your take of the flavor of, uh, and the culture of Washington today? And what does the president need to do uh, to be more effective? Well, the last one's the toughest question. Uh, I'm going yeah. to leave that as I work through the other part. Yeah. I think uh, you know, part of the problem, I think, is this erosion uh, of some people's belief in compromise. Uh, and I think that's been a real problem. I, I mean, we all have strong opinions. I have strong opinions as anybody. And... We can be stubborn on point, but you get into legislating because you believe that you can work out some resolutions with people from various backgrounds and points of view. And so if, if you're going to get elected to the House of Representatives of the United States Senate, you should go in with a mindset that you want to fight for your point of view, you want to you know, work as hard as you can in that direction, but at some point you want to try to make things work for people and come to some resolve, which means you have to have some give and take. There's an element there now that doesn't believe in that. Uh, and that makes it very difficult for any president, and it makes it difficult for the leaders in the House, whatever party they might be, uh, and the Senate. Uh, if one group just says flat out that they want it all their way, and they don't want to compromise at all, uh, then unless you have all one party in power, that's just not going to work. Uh, and that's what we have now. We have a Democratic president and a, a Democratic Senate, but a, a Republican House, and many people in the, uh, the newly major new majority in the House believe that they don't want to compromise. And I think they give John Boehner, who's the Republican um, Speaker of the House, uh, conniption fits because I've worked with John for a lot of years. And I think he would be prepared uh, to work on some things and try to reach a resolve on them, but feels politically constrained, probably at risk of losing his speakership if he were to uh, try to compromise on some of these issues. So that's the dynamic that's down there that makes it difficult for the House to function the way it should uh, and for the president to get accomplished the things that he would want to get accomplished. Uh, and that seems to be, I think, the overlying problem down there now is people are going to have to come to some realization that everybody has to give something. This is a time where the country has to come together. If I had any criticism of the president, and you're right, he's, he's got a great gift in being able to address people, speak to people, and both po poetry and pose, prose on that. Um, I think that he needed to set the message out there, not to fix blame, uh, obviously, as, as a partisan, you want to fix blame mm. for where people are or something like that, and, and I think it should be clear. But you don't want to make the same mistakes you made in the past. Uh, so if you look at where our debt comes from, it's a pretty clear message 
that he could give better than anybody. If I were to give this message or somebody in the Senate or in the House, people are going to say, oh, you're a Democratic member of the House and you're trying to blame George Bush or on that basis. Uh, in a sense, I might be in some areas on that and saying, well, you have to acknowledge the truth. But the president has an incredibly effective way of speaking about things without affixing blame. Uh, and he can present that well and just say in his new election, he could have said, look, uh, this isn't for the purpose of affixing blame. This is for identifying how it is we got where we are, where we are, and setting the tone that unless we all work together, we can't get out of this. And I hoped that he would start saying that the day he got elected and work through that. Uh, he was afraid that uh, Republicans would see that as too contentious and that he wouldn't be able to work with them. Well, that happened anyway, unfortunately. And you had Mitch McConnell, the Senate majority leader, the Senate minority leader, coming out very shortly after the election saying that he thought his goal in life was to make sure this president never got a second term. So I think that the White House should have recognized at that point that a lot of their work had to be doing a message to the American people to get them motivated to get their representatives and senators behind working out some solutions as opposed to taking polar opposite positions. Uh, and I think if he had done that and had that message going on a regular routine that this is what happened, this is how we got where we are, and now we all have to work together to get out would be in a better stead. Uh, it's never too late, I suspect, to, uh, to get into that mode, but I think the only way he's going to really move us forward here is to get the American people to start putting some pressure on those that just won't compromise uh, and those, that those are willing to go to the brink all the time. And uh, it's, a, it's a different world in Washington in some ways, I suspect, uh, because one of the uh, past presidents that I think of um, uh, is uh, whether one uh, sort of appreciated him or not uh, was Lyndon Johnson in his ability to uh, bring parties together. Um, uh, he did it in ways that Obama probably uh, wouldn't abide. Yeah. Uh, but uh, regardless, Johnson had the, the ability to pull off really quite remarkable deals be between uh, very divergent constituencies. He did. But, you know, they're two different individuals with different natures, and the times were different as well, and he had different majorities. Uh, yes. moving forward. So he was able to be more forceful and take a, a much uh, starker position in many things and drive it through. Uh, but he also, I think, he did have a position uh, and had made that very well known and fought for it. And I think we probably want to see a little bit more of that uh, coming out of the White House. Is, you know, instead of waiting for the House or the Senate, which is obviously a difficult process, people are 435 members of the House all trying to come to a compromise, mm -hmm. 100 members of the Senate, the White House sometimes has to have a clearer position of, of where they want to be. And I don't think we can neglect, however, noticing that he did establish uh, quite a lot and accomplished quite a lot so far. Some people don't like it, and mm -hmm. that's a problem for them. The health care uh, legislation was a tremendous uh, effort you know, to get that done. Now, many, many people on the Republican side in particular didn't care for it. Uh, they made it difficult to pass anything at all in the beginning, and they've been fighting it ever since. But that was a piece of legislation that other presidents had tried to pass and had not passed. We've got some great education uh, legislation passed. I say that trying not to be immodest on that because we had a, a lot to do with it. But, you know, it has made college more affordable for students and their parents and uh, in a time where it still continues to be difficult to afford. Uh, but we, it, without raising taxes a bit, we got $61 billion in savings simply by knocking out the middleman on student loans. For the longest while, it was set up that lenders were getting a subsidy to give loans, ostensibly because they weren't a profitable industry when that wasn't really the case. And then they were getting their loan repayment guaranteed. Well, by eliminating that and putting the loans out directly to the students and families, we saved $61 billion. So we were able to pay $10 billion down on the debt. Uh, we were able to support community colleges, which is playing an ever larger role in our education process beyond high school. Uh, we were able to give more Pell Grant money because it had fallen substantially behind uh, the ratio that it had been for our students' uh, cost factor going back to the 70s, uh, and to do some more campus-based aid on that to support our institutions. So, we did a lot of other things in there about the transparency and knowledge for parents and students to be able to shop around for what the best institution for them was, uh, put it all up on the internet, got the Department of Education to do a lot of work there, and the institutions themselves to do it, rewarded institutions that keep their cost increases down uh, beneath the higher education cost index, uh, and give them rewards and don't reward those that go out of line on that. So the families have an idea of what's going to cost their student, not just in the first year, but for four years on that. So he should get some credit for that, for, for working on what he's done for community colleges and colleges, the education piece for affordability there, the, uh, the Health Care Act. We passed a good energy bill in 2009 
uh, that was a good start. We, I think we passed a better one in the House that was for, for discussion that never got through the Senate, but we did pass one through the House and the Senate that allowed us to have uh, far more work done on renewables and efficiencies and alternatives uh, and try to turn us into a country that can compete with the Chinas, Japans, and Germanys, and others and in terms of uh, energy products and jobs and things of that nature. And we're going to get, uh, that's a very good uh, But he's done all that. And yeah. my point really was that it, w it was, for instance, the most effective Congress since 1964. Uh, people don't realize that. The 2007 to 2010 period, uh, and that's based on legislation that was actually signed by the president. And he doesn't seem to get the credit that he probably deserves on that, nor does he get the credit, frankly, for doing legislation that stopped us from going into a depression. You know, everybody, there's a lot of people out there saying that, oh, well, the so-called Stimulus Act, uh, they want to trash it. But uh, there are a number of things. Ask any governor, ask our governor in particular, ask our businesses in our district, ask our school systems and our the municipalities yes. how they would have survived, you know, even to the extent that they did without that uh, Recovery and Reinvestment mm -hmm. Act. Uh, and we're still creating jobs on that basis. I go around from time to time in our district uh, with Jeff Simons, who was the governor's appointee to implement the, pro uh, the state monies that came out of it, uh, with jobs. 10,000 houses were weatherized. You know, people getting jobs in the energy front and in transportation. A lot of teachers and firefighters and police kept on the job. I mean, communities would have had less uh, protection and uh, less going on in the classroom had it not been for that. And the, the Congressional Budget Office and other independent sources say very clearly, uh, that uh, it created jobs, it saved a lot of jobs, and it actually stopped this country from sliding into depression uh, and started to move us out. Now, do we want to be further along, and, and had we hoped that the bill had been even better? Absolutely, but we have to remember the people that stopped the bill from being better, the ones that wouldn't let it be the size that it needed to be, and the focus that it needed to focus on are the same ones that are trashing it now. So he may not be getting uh, the credit, and so somehow one, one thing might have to happen is uh, finding a way for that to uh, uh, be more of a public uh, uh, view because the uh, you know his uh, his most public uh, kind of uh, uh, presence came around uh, the decisions which ultimately rested with him in uh, the action against Osama bin Laden right. uh, which uh, I think that was the the peak of his public uh, uh, career in terms of visibility and decisiveness mm -hmm. um, but I think um, one would suggest that he ha needs more moments of that. Well, or needs to take credit for the things that do happen. Mm -hmm. And again, I think part of his nature is he doesn't want to be contentious. He really doesn't want to be partisan. So he doesn't like the appearance of, you know, like, aha, I accomplished this and you didn't. Or we're going to do this even though you may disagree. He'd rather work with both parties uh, and try to come to agree that we did this together which means that he doesn't take credit because most of what he's accomplished he's done despite the objections of people who didn't want to see a better energy policy, who didn't want to see the education reforms made, uh, who didn't want to see health care reforms made. So if you're not going to take credit for it, people don't think that you played a role. Now I think the House role was the one that was instrumental in most of those things. That's where the impetus came from during a period of time, but it could not have been done without him using his leadership to make sure that it, the, the final signatures was there. But you, know, you have to be willing to make that message, and I think he's got to get over the point that it's going to make him look like he's bragging or being contentious with the Republicans or whatever. It's an example of where he is and what he's fighting for. Mm -hmm. And those are values that I find, you know, at least around this district, very popular. People want good energy policy, good education policy, and good health care policy. The, uh, uh, you had mentioned that uh, you had been in contact with the, the new uh, super committee right. uh, looking for transparency and... Uh, uh, did you get a response from them, or what is your what is your sense of uh, where that's going to go over the next six months? Well, it'll be easy to sense once we get back into session and, and we have some direct communication with folks. Um, I know that the House leadership is interested in making sure that the transparency is there. I suspect that Harry Reid may be as well. I won't be able to judge where John Boehner and Mitch McConnell, those people are probably until we get back and we hear more directly from them. But it would make sense that if you're going to... Um, defer a lot of your legislative authorities, just 12 people, that the public has to know what's going on. This can't be a closed committee in a back room. Uh, we have to know who's influencing these people, who are they listening to, and what it is they're saying, how the shape of that debate is going. And so Senator Kerry is Senator Kerry is on it, and I think he's just fine with this. He's, he's usually very transparent in what he does at any rate, uh, as are a number of those people on the committee so far. So I don't know that it's going to be all that objectionable, uh, but I think it's something we have to make sure that it, it does happen. I think there'll be some school of, uh, of folks that say, well, you know, nothing will happen if it happens publicly. It's got to happen in the back room and, and, and the deal has to come out like that. 
Uh, that doesn't bode well for democracy if we start thinking of that. Everything from the open meeting law to our local community meetings all the way up are on the notion that we all get to see what's going on. It's above board. And particularly where money uh, plays such a big influence in politics these days, whether it's through lobbying or campaign contributions, where the perception of, of what it plays at the very least, I think it's uh, indicative that of thing, a need to make sure that it's all fully in the open. Yeah, and one might argue is what is, you know, what is required of the Burlington Board of Selectmen um, should also be required of the Super Committee. Yeah. Uh, but